Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. Have you heard that the inaugural Landscape Photography World Awards is now open for entries? Early bird entry is available now at a discounted fee until September 30, 2022. Head to landscapephotographyworldawards.com to find out all the details and how to enter. There's some amazing prizes to be won and I'll be publishing a book and a calendar with the top images at the end of the competition, so there's plenty to look forward to. Entries close on November 30, 2022, so there's plenty of time to get your entry sorted, but if you want to get into the early birds, do it now. I'd also like to thank the judges who have agreed to work with me and be a big part of the awards. Deb Clark, Victoria Hark, Kieran Stone and William Patino. I certainly couldn't make this competition a reality without their support. Chris Wright is a photographer living on Sydney's northern beaches whose interests extend from natural and urban landscapes to travel and street photography. As a university professor and senior climate change researcher, he has a strong interest in the natural environment and the sustainability of ecosystems and planetary health. His photography journey began more than 30 years ago growing up around Sydney Harbour, using his first cameras to capture the beauty of the ocean as well as on fishing trips to Australia's tropical north and Papua New Guinea. Many of his images featured in fishing magazines at the time. In the 2010s, he rediscovered a love of photography on overseas trips to major cities in North America, Europe and Asia. Embracing mirrorless small format cameras, this late in life rediscovery of the joy of photography has grown into a consuming passion as his knowledge of the technical aspects of composition and post-processing has developed. In recent years, the pandemic has led him to shift his attention towards local seascape and landscape compositions and explore the creative possibilities of hidden waterfalls and the beauty of beaches and headlands at sunrise and sunset. He's also sought to marry his research interest in climate change with photographic projects exploring the fossil fuel industry and its physical impacts on the landscape and society. This includes exploring ways to extend his photographic vision into artistic and abstract compositions, which address the realities of the vulnerability of the natural environment and the changing landscape we're now living within. We discuss climate change and the challenges we face with it, how Chris uses his imagery in his educational career, the way photography has helped him with mental health and his career as a client scientist, along with a whole lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey Chris, welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? I'm good, thanks Grant. Great to be here. Yeah, fantastic to have you. Why don't you start with telling us who you are and why you do what you do? Okay, uh, well my name's Chris Wright. Uh, I'm an enthusiast landscape street travel photographer. Mm. Uh, I live on the northern beaches of Sydney, uh, which is a very picturesque part of the world, so I've been very lucky to be living here the last 30 years or so. Um, and in my day job, I'm a professor at the University of Sydney and I research climate change. So cool. um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few things I want to talk to you about then uh, a little bit later, if that's okay. Indeed. Yeah, sure. All right. So what got you into photography and in particular landscape photography? Uh, well, long story short, I guess I, I grew up in Sydney um, uh, around the harbour, around Sydney Harbour as a young kid in the 70s. Uh, I did a lot of fishing and a lot of windsurfing. And so I was down by the water. And I guess out of out of that, uh, particularly with the fishing, uh, you tended to have a camera or you you would bug your parents to take a photo of the fish you caught type thing. Yep, uh, and yep. then as I, I got older, older um, in my 20s, uh, I was at university, but I was still very heavily into the fishing. And I did quite a few trips to the tropical north, so Coburg Peninsula and the Northern Territory or New Britain up in the New Guinea area. Mm. And a lot of the people I was fishing with uh, were writing for fishing magazines and they'd have SLR cameras and they'd be shooting film, you know, yep. Fiji Velvia and Kodachrome and all that. And so I was doing that too. And they were mostly pictures of guys with big fish. Um, but, That's what uh, the fishing magazines want. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But you'd also be in these exotic places and you'd see amazing sunrises and sunsets. Yeah. In New Britain, we were going up rivers 
and and visiting villages that probably hadn't seen many white people before and maybe seen the American missionaries or whatever. Oh. And so back then I had these fantastic slide shots of, of people, uh, villages, uh, tropical wildlife, uh, sunsets, sunrises, all this sort of stuff. Didn't do much with the photography through the 90s. I sort of drifted away from that. But mm. when in, in the academic job, one of the benefits of that, of course, is that as you, you get more senior, you get to travel and you go to conferences and expectation, you, you present papers. So I got to travel to some pretty amazing places in America and Europe and Asia. And I'd always have a camera with me to take travel shots. Um, and I guess it was around sort of 2015, I, I had a conference. I was going to go to Greece, to Athens, and I decided I really needed to get serious. I had a, a Canon point and shoot type camera, digital camera back then, and it took yep. okay photos. But um, I think in the lead up to that trip, I decided, well, I need to get up, uh, I need a changeable lens camera. Um, and I did some research and I decided I needed something fairly small and portable. So I went with the the Olympus ecosystem, I guess. Okay. And I had a, a little Olympus camera uh, and I bought a pro lens, pro zoom lens. And it was this, this this conference in Athens. It was just serendipitous. It was the eve of the Grexit vote. So they were voting on yeah, whether yeah. they would leave the EU. Mm -hmm. And I got to my hotel in Athens and I turned on the BBC News and I could see this massive protest, 50,000 people in St. Agnes Square. And I thought, where is this place? This would be kind of fun to shoot this. So I pulled up the phone and I'll blow me down. It's 50 metres behind the hotel. So wow. the next four days I was at the conference, but in the evenings I was at these protests that went on all yeah. week and just shooting people and, and the, the riot police and, and all of this stuff. And um, from then on, you know, I've, been, I've had a, these cameras with me wherever I travel. Uh, and and I guess the, the transition into landscape was essentially uh, that in these travels I'd be visiting sort of pretty scenic spots. Mm. Um, and then I guess with the pandemic as well, I've sort of transitioned away from the travel and street sort of photography much more into the landscape because that's what's been available on my doorstep. So sure, sure. a bit of a long-winded answer, but that's the sort of the story. Oh, well, I, I like long-winded answers. It uh, <laughs> make, makes it makes my life a lot easier. I don't have to talk as much. What is it that you're chasing now most in your photography? Uh, obviously, it's it, it's not your primary career, but uh, I'm I'm just interested, I guess, in in what it is that you you're after and what are you what are you motivated by? Yeah, um, I guess there's a couple of things. With the pandemic, you know, the last two, three years, it's been, um, I really have transitioned very, very heavily into landscape photography now. Uh, I used to do a lot more sort of street photography, travel photography. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't travelled overseas now, well, since the pandemic. Um, uh, so I, when in the, in the travel street sort of vogue, I, I guess I was interested in people and light and compositions and some sort of composition that would tell us sort of a story. And a lot yeah. of that sort of photography was very serendipitous. You'd, you'd have your camera, you'd be walking along and you'd see people, light, some sort of composition, you take the shot or you take a lot of shots and one of those would come out and you think that's pretty good and, and you process it up and work with it. Landscape, in the move to landscape, I guess, where I live, uh, I'm, I'm right on the, the northern beaches of Sydney, so fantastic seascapes, particularly for sunrise, you know, facing mm. east and um, fantastic One of, one of my favourite go-tos. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and we were really spoiled in the pandemic. I, I really felt for you guys, you were sort of locked down in your LGA, your local government well, area. But I, I'm, I'm taking the positives out of that. I started this podcast because of exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> well, we had, you know, at the other end, we had from basically Manly all the way up to Barrenjoey Headland to play with. So, um, yeah, so the seascapes are a really big part of my life, I guess. Uh, and then um, we've had a lot of La Nina summers, La Nina weather full stop. And so mm. I've been hunting waterfalls and doing trips up to the Blue Mountains when we could and then f discovering sorts of waterfalls that are just in my local area. Um, yeah, it's so amazing how many waterfalls are actually in the Sydney metropolitan area. You know, a lot of people, are, I don't think, realise there's places like Balaka and um, Alambi and um, uh, what's the other one down there near Terry Hills? Irrawong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, Irrawong's amazing because that's literally a five-minute walk from my place. Wow. Um, and then I discovered, I think it was about a month or two ago, there's all of these other Irrawong falls further up the, the yeah. catchment. But um, they only really perform when you've got a little rainfall. And so yeah, when that's we, it. They're normally just a little trickle there. Yeah, well, when we had these 
deluges of rain, you know, I've discovered these incredible waterfalls and you, you pinch yourself, you think you're in the Amazon or something, this rushing flow of water. Um, so that's been a lot of fun, um, sort of hunting down new compositions in the local context. Hmm. And I guess what am I trying to do with the photography of the landscape? Um, there's the trying to sort of capture the the image of um, impressive sort of wildlife and, and photography in a, a beautiful scene. But the other part of it is I'm trying to now, and it's a work in progress, I'm trying to move towards a sort of more creative artistic take on that. Mm, okay. um, and that, that goes all the way from something like, you know, messing with exposure times to smooth out water, blur water, or do something with moving yeah. water, which is obviously not something that the human eye sees. Yeah. Um, uh, through to more recently, I've been playing around with um, finding sort of more abstract type compositions. There was a, a whirlpool I found on one of my waterfall works about a month or so ago, um, which had formed because of the massive flow of water. And I was sort of standing above this hole in the rock where this water was swirling down, it's mm. about six foot across. And I was just shooting shots, playing with exposure, playing with aperture, and then getting home and then doing some rather probably overly creative work in the post-processing, <laughs> but I kind of liked the result. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. But, but that's the important thing, you know, to be honest, I I think if you're enjoying yourself and you're enjoying the, the output that you get, who cares if nobody else likes it, you know? And, I mean, it's always nice when somebody comes along and gives you a pat on the head and says, yeah, that's, that's a great shot. But, you know, it, to me, it's, it, it's really about that, Self enjoyment, the the ability to create something that you are proud of, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, very much. Um, I mean, there's also uh, the other thing I kind of like about doing the landscape type stuff is the the thrill of the hunt. So, doing mm. the research and um, seeing somebody's shot uh, a composition somewhere on Instagram or social media, and you think, wow, that's a really interesting place. I wouldn't mind going visiting that. And then you get on Google Maps and you sort of work out roughly where it might be, and then you. Yep. You get your app out on your phone and you go bush bashing and try and find <laughs> wherever you're looking for. So there's there's a lot. Of, I have to say with the, the switch to landscape, I've got a new appreciation for the local and, and more distant um, contexts. Uh, yeah. discover, I've seen so much more of Australia now and I'm just wishing I'd done this 40 years ago. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very much the same. It's something that I, would, I, I wish I'd got back to earlier. But, uh, you know, I'm here where I am now so and, and enjoying it. Um, I guess you, you talked a little bit about that switch to being more creative and more artistic in your photography. Was that like a, a, a switch flicked in your brain and you said, all right, well, this is what I want to do, or is that more of a gradual process? Talk to me a little bit about how that went for you. Yeah, I think it has been a, a, a gradual progress. As I said, it's a work in progress. I'm not really where I'd like to be at, uh, in terms of really moving towards a more sort of abstract expressionist sort of take on photography. Sure. Um, my wife is a um, very experienced design architect. And so over our, um, over our, what is it, 30 years of marriage or whatever it is, you know, uh, we've been to a lot of um, art galleries, contemporary art. So I get familiar through osmosis with this stuff. I'm not yeah, right. across it as, as well as I should be, but I'm trying to learn more about the sort of um, the artistic temperament and the aesthetics of sort of clever composition and, and, and all this sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, that's been something I've been trying to work on. And I guess technically what I've been doing is, um, well, I discovered the beauties of wide-angle lenses about two years ago, and I've become mm -hmm. kind of addicted to them, which I know is not necessarily good, but um, oh. I just love the way you can get close to a foreground element and just blow up the scene. Yeah, um, yeah. And it gives that level of sort of unrealistic vision. I kind of like it, that distortion. Um, so there's that, um, getting more technically proficient with the post-processing and, and what you can do with that has helped, I think, a lot too. I mean, back in the when I was beginning and I was just discovering digital photography and the fact that you can take a raw photo as opposed to a JPEG and then you can do all this stuff to it. And I, I've sort of fell down the rabbit hole of initially probably not good stuff, like just relying on presets. But now um, it's very much, you know, taking a raw image and working from scratch um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in Photoshop and Lightroom and all this sort of thing. Uh, and so the creative possibilities are sort of endless once you go down that rabbit hole. I love that. Yeah, um, totally. So, do, you have, yeah. do you have any particular goals? Do you feel it's important to have a goal in your photography or is it 
purely a relaxation thing and therefore you don't feel the, the, the need? Um, interesting question. Yeah, I don't know about goals. I, I guess one goal for me at the moment is to sort of develop that more artistic take on landscapes and seascapes mm -hmm. rather than just the standard, this is the image of the, the beach at sunrise type thing. So finding those really interesting and, and atypical compositions. Uh, and I spent a lot of time, like just this morning, wandering around looking at a beach I'm very, very familiar with. And I've probably been there several hundred times and I'm looking for, oh, I haven't seen that rock before. What happens if I get really low and really close? Yep. Um, what's that going to look like? Um, you know, the water's coming. So there's there's the sort of the hunt for the composition. And, and I guess the goal there is to find, come up with an image that is different and perhaps hasn't been taken before or people look and go, oh, gee, that's that's something new. Um, so there's always that sort of hunt for the new take, I guess, on on things and and to present that in a fairly interesting and unusual way. Um, the other angle, I guess, is that I've started a project, it's been going for a couple of years now, uh, where I'm trying to marry my photography interests with my research interests right. and do something around climate change and the climate crisis. And so I have shot, you know, back pre-COVID, I was shooting a lot of climate protests. I was taking photos of big coal handling facilities um, mm -hmm. big, um, flying the drone over coal mines and 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 yeah, I mean that's something I haven't really. I'm trying to develop a bit more and um, yeah, that's a sort of a goal. That's a project in in the moment. yeah, cool. I think you know a lot of a lot of photographers uh, sometimes without realizing it, you know, do work on those sort of projects sort of things. They it's an obsessive sort of compulsion to take the photos and once you find a piece of subject matter that fascinates you you want to take more and you know for, for me I've I've had projects grow without really realizing that that was the goal of the project I, I probably find about halfway through <coughs> pardon me I find about halfway through actually building that portfolio oh that that's actually a project <laughs> yeah um so i mean has that happened with you or is it uh been something that's been a little bit more deliberate up front yeah the 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 fossil fuel climate one is is obviously a deliberate project that i sort of sure. started out with the idea and i thought i wonder if that's possible and i didn't really know what it would look like and it's involved a sort of combination of as i've said sort of almost photojournalistic shots of protesters at a climate march or that big school climate strike where there were like 100,000 people in the domain and, and that sort of thing, um, through to much more sort of serendipitous shots, you know, of big coal ships coming through the Hunter River or yep. um, flying a drone up over a power station or something. Um, so that, that project is sort of something I wanted to do and I sort of tried to map out what that might look out like and scope out potential locations and that has sort of dribbled along. It's not, I thought it was going to be much easier than it, it's turned out to be. And it's, sort of, <laughs> it's just sort of trickling along. Whereas the the other stuff, I don't know, I've got projects for the landscape. I think I just, I've got sort of hooked into the habit of shooting my local area, seascapes mostly, sunrise and sunset, yep. um, always on the lookout for the on the weather apps about what the rainfall is going to be like and going off and hunting waterfalls. We've had a big dump of rain. Sure. Um, the other thing I have done, I guess, a project was um, trips to more remote locations. So I did a trip a couple of years ago up to the Warren Bungles. Yes. My son was at a camp up there and I thought, well, I'll I'll go up there and bring him back. Um, but in the meantime, I can also get a couple of days of shooting up the Warren Bungles. So that was good. <laughs> um, or doing a sort of a sortie down to Kayama or, or up. the other one I want to do is go further to the south coast and and you know, down to Bermagui and Rumor and all down there. Yeah, I haven't done yeah. that yet. So I've got a, a bucket list of locations which could become projects. Just got to find the time. Yeah, no, I I, I know what you mean there. And you know, I, I think that freeing up of the time is is an important thing. How do you, I guess, balance? Obviously, you know, uh, you've probably got a fairly busy work schedule. How do you busy? How do you um, balance that with your photography? And the desire to get out when the conditions are right, when you you know you should be in the office, but you you're going to go seascaping anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess the pandemic has been a blessing in that regard, um, in the sense that you know we moved to online teaching beginning a third of the way through 2020, 
yeah. uh, and and although we've still got students on campus now to come back um still a lot of our teaching is online so there is a little bit more flexibility than it used to be but even when i was you know in at uni five days a week when i was head of discipline or something i'd always have a camera in the bag and in yeah. fact i've got some i i would just wander around uni if there was a sort of an off time in the afternoon um and and i knew there was going to be a good sunset i'd wander up to the great the great hall of the quadrangle and, and shoot some yeah. shots off there and so you'd, you'd serendipitously take the shots when you can and then of course uh, back when we were traveling um the cameras would go with me if i was in japan or uh, i was in uh, the uk or europe or the states you know mm. and so as i was saying with the greece example you know you'd be at a conference during the day but i'd be out all night and up at the crack of dawn shooting photos <laughs> if i could get the chance because i thought i'm not going to be coming back to kyoto in a hurry so i'm going to get some photos okay. What what does the experience of photography mean to you? Uh, well, at one level, it's it's about capturing memories and scenes. Um, uh, so, you know, particularly the tra travel, it's unlikely I'll go back to some of these places and I'm trying to sort of cut back on my air travel, actually. Um, so there's the, the photography of, of, of capturing a feeling or an emotion or a scene during your travels and, and places you've been to. And I find I've got into the habit of sort of creating a, a sort of a diary of my life and photos. I just slot photos that I've taken into that diary sometimes just to, to, to create that sort of memory link. Um, but also I think there's the, the potential for photography to carry a message. And that's mm. something that I'm sort of trying to explore a bit with the climate stuff. Um, I was watching, um, Edward Batinsky's in town last week, you know, fantastic Canadian um, photographer, does these amazing aerial shots of um, forests being cut down. And that's his thing. He wrote this whole book on the Anthropocene and these massive yep. images of mostly North American, but also around the world, you know, massive factories in China and things. And he's clearly, his photography clearly has a sort of a fairly strong political message, although he, he sort of claims he's fairly, you know, ambivalent about a lot of these things. Mm. So I think, you know, the way you frame up a photo, what you take a photo of, how you express that image can have a very powerful message. Um, and that's something I'm sort of interested in exploring the sort of the politics of photography is quite fascinating, I think. Sure, sure. Let, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. I guess, obviously, you know, in, in your work, at the uni, you know, client science, client science, client science is you know a, a major part of what you're doing. Um, less so on the photography side, but how urgent do you see the dangers and the risks that we're seeing in climate change? You know, how drastic do you feel that it is? You know, having studied, you know, the science yeah. behind it. Yeah, well, this is this is always a bit difficult. I often have to calibrate the message that I send to students and and, and audiences that I speak to publicly because you don't want to freak people out and send people into a world of depression. But yeah, um, I just tweeted something the other day on my work tweet about it's much later in the day than our political and corporate leaders um, think it is. Uh, mm -hmm. You just look at what's happening in Pakistan at the moment. You know, there's thirty odd million people displaced, thousands killed by these floods and um the climate change signature there is very very strong um and you can look at all the extreme weather events have been happening both northern and southern hemisphere the black summer fires we had in 2019 2020 um so yeah we're seeing climate change human induced climate disruption in real time now and um so i think yeah it's, it's super urgent it's the greatest threat that we face as a species to be honest mm. um and we have to get off fossil energy at you know, warp speed and, and really transition things very, very fast. So it, it's a huge challenge, um, a huge threat uh, to us. And Australia is, you know, physically one of the most vulnerable of the continents in the world. You know, we can see inside there's a spread around the coasts and uh, the fire potential, the drought potential, the flood potential, Lismore, we just saw that. So there's, there's lots and lots of examples of extreme weather linked to climate disruption happening now. And it's going to get worse, unfortunately. We're going to see more of it. Mm -hmm. um and and that's i guess getting back to the photography that's that's part of the sort of the issue uh we start to see these images on our screens on our social media of floods i just saw something now of uh, this this incredible video footage from pakistan of the, the flood water rushing down the mountains and these villages running out of the way of the flood water yeah. that, um that avalanche that was on social media the other day about the 
the, the glacier giving way and the, this guy filming it as it's coming towards him sort of thing. Mm, um, mm. So there's the danger that climate change becomes the spectacle and we just observe it, observe yeah. the disaster. Yeah, um, you, you, you're basically out there shooting that sort of stuff for the gram. Yeah, yeah, it, be- it becomes this sort of, yeah, this this commodity. Um, yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, I think there's there's the danger. The problem has been that we haven't spoken about this, frankly, um, for too long. It's, I call it climate change fight club. First rule is we don't talk about climate change. Yeah. Um, and there's been this whole political thing about, oh, you can't talk about it, it's it's contested or it's, it's going to frighten people. And now I think too late we're starting to have a, a realisation that this is real, it's happening and it's potentially cataclysmic. It, it's, and, and, and it is having impacts on people's lives. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's more, the other side. More, of it. Pe- more people died in Europe in, in this summer than any other summer due to heat, you know? Yeah. Well, when we saw those wildfires in outside of London and England, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I was, so- I was there, I was there uh, in July and, you know, they had their, their 30... 35 degree day which was you know stinking hot in london because one of the key things uh, a lot of people that live in warmer climes like australia and whatever don't realize is their infrastructure and their housing and their you know shops and whatever they're not geared for air conditioning they don't most of them have heating not air conditioning yeah, indeed. And indeed. so that you know, you go into you get on the tube in London and it's 35 degrees and it's like 50 degrees inside the tube. It's horrible. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. there isn't air conditioning in most of the trains. Yeah, well, we live in this age of consequences, as I sort of say, the, the consequences of two centuries of burning coal, oil, and gas are now coming to bear, and mm. um we're realizing it. Um, so yeah, so the photography link there, I mean, there's the danger of just creating spectacles out of these extreme weather events and these people suffering and mostly developing economy situations. But on the other hand, I think on the positive side, there's a way in which you can grow uh, public awareness of the urgency yeah, sure. of the issue. Um, and that's that's sort of what I try to do a little bit. I Certainly in my teaching, I use a lot of images. I mean, uh, all of my teaching now are basically just images that I speak to um, mm. Less hardly any text, um, and I think yeah, that well, it's, has, it's, it's, that engages it's, people. Yeah, yeah, it's it's less fun looking at a graph showing how temperatures risen compared to, you know, actually seeing some of the consequences of it, as you say. Yeah, what do you what do you think it's going to take to, uh, you know, kickstart um, a, a change in our the, the way our politicians and in the way our businesses operate because. Effectively, for me, that's that's the only thing that's really going to shift the dial is if they get off their backside. And, you know, for me, I, I think it, you have to kind of look at this akin to the the ramp up that was done by the US, in, for, for example, uh, during World War II. Yeah. The entire economy shifted to delivering war goods from being a civilian, you know, commodity-based economy. Um, Are we seeing a point where we're going to have to shift to that kind of war footing and go, okay, we really need to go all out? Are we already past that point? Yeah, I think that's probably where we need to go. And there's there's been a number of people who've talked about the need for a sort of wartime mobilisation of climate. I mean, the difference, of course, is that with World War II, you had a, a clear and present danger. You yeah, know, and an and and a enemy that you could point at yeah, and say, the that's tangibility why I'm of the threat. Yeah. yeah, and the problem with climate change, as many have pointed out, this sort of wicked problem is that it plays out over time frames that of generations. Um, it's and people's memories aren't long enough. Yeah, yeah, and and it's hard to make that causal connection to drive the sort of political motivation and action. And um, what's it going to take? Well, it's going to require um, wholesale reinvention of how we get and use energy. Um, mm. And we're starting to see that There's, the penny is starting to drop in terms of the shift towards renewable energy and trying to move away from fossil energy. But the politics is sort of broken. So, um, you know, just in Australia, for example, uh, we have a new government and they're promoting emissions reduction, but at the same time they're opening up proposals for new um, gas and oil exploration down the Great Australian Bight, which is madness. Um, We shouldn't be opening up new fossil energy. We should be trying to transition. So, yeah, I think there are signs um, of change. Um, We're definitely going to transition. We have to adapt to the impacts already here. That's going to happen. Um, Is it too late? Well, it's too late to avoid climate change. That's here now. 
but it's a question of how bad we want it to be. Uh, yeah. 1.2 now will go beyond 1.5, see average global increase. Um, but it could go to two, three, four, whatever. Where, how bad do you want it sort of thing? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it requires a political response. Um, the technology is there. We know how to do it, but we need a political response, and that's the problem. Yeah, no, I'm t- totally with you on that. Uh, from my perspective, it's how do you how do you switch that on so that the, the response is actually going to uh, make the right choices, as you said, you know, not switching on new um, non-renewable, not switching on new gas and uh, coal and uh, whatever, you know. Yeah. Power and, and one, of, one of the ways that's been switched on, I think, and trying to get back to the photography just a little bit, is the, <laughs> the, the, the sort of the photographing those climate protests, particularly the, the school climate protests. The kids get this. I mean, the kids understand the climate threat and it, for them it's very, very real because yeah. they, what's, what's it going to Well, be? they know they're going to have to live with it. Exactly, yeah, and they're already seeing the impacts, the fires, the floods. So um, those protests, I think, uh, that groundswell of pressure that we've seen in Australia and the US and Europe um, is part of the, the move to, to do something about this because that forces politicians to recognise, well, the populace is getting a bit unruly here. We need to do something. So uh, we need both the sort of the grassroots, the bottom-up pressure to drive the top-down actions. Um, and so that's that's one hope, I think, that there's been some really important initiatives made through that groundswell of, of social movements, divesting yeah, yeah. from fossil fuels and doing all those sort of things. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, in terms of, I, I, in fact, next week I'm teaching a lecture on social movement organising around the climate change issue. And how do you communicate that? Well, a lot of it through visual imagery. Those fantastic. That's shots. exactly it. Yeah. Um, those kayaks in Seattle, I think it was, blockading one of the big oil rigs that was going to be towed up to the Arctic. Um, so those visual images, much like the response to the Vietnam War, those visual images are really key to driving um, public awareness. Mm-hmm. Let's move back to the photography. I know uh, this isn't a, a, a political or a climate change. <laughs> podcast but to me i i honestly think it's the 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 biggest challenge to photography let alone you know humankind because to be honest the the world is going to be fine on its own if we're not here the issue is us still being here to enjoy it but and that that that's the the biggest question is can can we survive it and can we uh can we stick around Let's talk about your, your local area. You mentioned some of your some of the beaches that you like to go to. What it is? What is it about them? And which, which locations do you just keep getting drawn back to, and why? Yeah, well, um, I, I guess one of the advantages of living in Eastern Australia is um, the sunrises. Uh, mm-hmm. I find sunrises so much easier than sunsets, and I think that has to do with the fact that the way that the coast faces east, basically, and the light is just so much. Um, more superior at sunrise. Um, So in terms of the the beaches, um, well, where I live on the northern beaches, I'm sort of five minutes walk from from Narrabeen Beach, Um, big famous surf beach, but the the rocky headlands all around there are fantastic. There's another beach further up Taramedo, which is probably my local. Um, I go there a lot and it's fantastic because it's a small beach with lots of rocky elements that are revealed and obscured by the sand movement over the seasons. So you can go there sometimes and it's all sandy and you wouldn't know there's any rocks there. And then we get the big winter storms and the rocks are revealed and they create great foreground, mid-ground type elements. Every time I go there, I I see something new and it's It's different. different, That's what I I love about that spot. I'm I'm drawn to there uh, simply because of that as well. It gets quite busy now in the mornings. It does, (laughs) yeah. I I got down there one morning. Uh, for for a shoot, and I think there was about thirty or forty other people here, <laughs> all all doing a shoot. So. so I have been, you know, getting out with with the pandemic. I I got into this walking thing. You know, I figured I'm not getting a whole lot of exercise. I can't swim in the pool now. I can't, whatever. So I'll go out for a walk. And what I'll do is go out for a walk in the evening, have the AirPods in my ears, listening to a podcast, and I will basically walk beaches and headlands and scope out potentially new, for me, new locations. So oh. I found some caves and I've found places that that will work on a high tide or work on a low tide because tides are really quite important for the seascape composition I've discovered. Um, swell. Um, and then basically sort of logging them in my diary or my memory banks and thinking, well, this place 
is going to be fantastic on a really high tide with a big swell. It's a nice mm-hmm. little cave. I can hide in there. If I get a nice burning sky, that'll set the whole thing off. So I'll wait and, for those conditions. Um, sunsets are interesting uh, because... Uh, you know, you've got the sun coming out of the way and you, a lot of these cliffs really obscure the light and sometimes that yeah. can work. But um, where I live, I've got this lake, Narrabeen Lake right next to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I find a water expanse is great for uh, capturing that and reflecting that sort of sunset sunset colours. Um, and the, the trick is trying to find the foreground element to, to really make the shot. Yeah, um, yeah. Fallen trees, a boat, something like that. Uh, and then the other places I've been looking at, I've been going a bit further afield, um, trying to find that westerly aspect or a northwesterly aspect for the sunset with some interesting rocks, some some interesting rock pools, that sort of thing. And um, so, you know, I'll climb up the top of Barren Joey Headland sometimes and I'll climb out on cliffs and things looking for that sort of angle. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, 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 they're the main places I sort of go to. I do love Long Reef. That's where I tend to go most of my afternoon walks. Because okay, you can get yeah. get that low tide reflection, and you can get some fantastic sort of tessellated sort of effects with the, yeah, the right. rocks. Um, yeah, cool. What's the most notable experience you've had uh, out shooting? Yeah, uh, I guess on the landscape side, I would say shooting the Warren Bungles. So, um, and a specific part of the Warren Bungles. Actually, I I worked out I wanted to to go up the top of lose throne and shoot the bread knife and all of that stuff um and it was november a year or two ago now so it was getting quite warm and i just sort of got up to kuna barabram when i was staying and then jumped in the car grabbed my camera gear and just shot up there and took like a liter of water and thought nothing of it a bit of a a hike up to the top there suddenly (laughs) discovered how steep it was and how long it took (laughs) two hours later i'm up the top there and I've, the water's gone, and I'm feeling very, very thirsty. And uh, and the sky didn't really go off, but I got some nice shots. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then then realised it was dark, and I'm up there by myself, and I sort of hadn't taken notice of how I got up there. And I was sort of hunting around the top bit there, trying to work out, well, how do I go down? And I took a few wrong turns, but eventually spotted some cat's eyes that someone had glued into the rock and thought, ah, oh, this is the way down. And um, then the next day, I sort of <laughs> recovered the next day, rehydrated, and then saw the forecast for the, that last night, the next night, and thought, wow, this looks great. So I went back up there again. And um, this time I took two litres of water, and that was still wasn't enough. I <laughs> uh, got to the top, and there was another guy who came up uh, who I didn't know, but he he lent me a bit of water and uh, shot that. So that that's right through the dark. That sunset was just incredible, and it was yeah. 108, 270 degrees, amazing sky. And the question was... Um, finding the composition and running around like a mad thing with three different zoom lenses, trying to do everything. Um, yeah, that was pretty amazing. I, I really enjoyed that. On the the travel side, though, I think some of my most memorable shots have been to places that, you know, that I'd wanted to go that I'd seen other people had shot and I'd put a lot of preparation into how to do it and how to get there and what time to get there. Um, so uh, when I was in Japan... Um, I was shooting all these locations in Shinjuku and Tokyo mm-hmm. uh, and then got the, the Shinkansen down to Kyoto, the bullet train, and I knew I wanted to shoot the bamboo garden and I'd seen um, uh, Elia Locardi had done this video about how to shoot these spots. The, yeah, the get there very Mar- early. <laughs> yeah, the Fujimari gates and the bamboo, and I'd realised, yeah. yeah, you have to get up early. So I basically did that and I was out of my hotel at 4 a.m. and jumped into a taxi and luckily the guy could speak a bit of English and I want to go to this place and then I'd be there standing in the dark in the middle of this bamboo garden uh waiting for some light set up my camera set up the composition and start getting the shots as the light appeared behind the bamboo and I got some great shots and then blow me down sort of 20 minutes later this car appears at the end of the track and drives down towards me this little mini coupe done up parks halfway down the road Lights on, guy gets out and starts taking photos of his car in the bamboo garden. <laughs> so, so I thought, well, he's going to be there a while. So I, I sort of wandered down and started chatting to him in broken English Japanese and took a few photos of him with his car. That was kind of fun. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but out of, out of there by seven, the tour buses were arriving. I was walking out by the time the tourists were walking in. So that was great. It was a real feeling of accomplishment, that one. Yeah, no, it's uh, it gets busy down there at, and uh, if you, if you're not there before uh, before sunrise, you, you you're very unlikely to get it uh, 
get the, the the shot that everyone wants where there's nobody around. You know? Yeah, well, the same with the, the 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 magenta gates or those bright red gates, the Fujimara gates or whatever they are. And I was there, first person there in the dark, shooting away. Yeah. Um, and then as just the first light appeared, uh, this film crew turned up, this Italian film crew with video oh, wow. cameras and lights and everything. And I thought, oh, that's it, I'm out of here, sort of thing. And they were sort of <laughs> complaining that were tourists around. I said, well, you should have been here an hour ago. You would have got the shots. You know? That's it. <laughs> Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's all. It, it, it's funny. I think uh, you know, photographers, whether it be travel or landscape, one of the things that they they dislike the most is uh, seeing people in the shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm guilty of that. I'm really bad at that. I'm, um, I'm, I'm the same. I've got, I've got a little bit more relaxed about it. I've, I've, I caught this one actually down at Taramata of a, uh, a rock fisherman. He's fairly small in the frame, but um, he actually added to the scene. Yes, it's, yeah. He, he stayed nice scale. and still. Yeah. But he stayed yeah. nice and still too. So there wasn't all this blurring around him where he was moving about, which was nice. Which, yeah. Uh, my my favorite one on that was we, we had this European trip just before the pandemic and we ended up, we, it was Spain and Italy, and we ended up in Rome. And, and sort of the last day we went to the Vatican museums, which although it was January, it was low season, it was crowded with people. And I'd seen the shot that people take of the famous spiral sp staircase. Yep. And I knew it was coming up and I thought, I'm going to try this shot. And so I had the camera and sort of up the ISO a bit and stood there and figured, no tripod, I'm going to have to do this handheld mm. and wide angle lens. And I could see like 50 people on the spiral staircase. So I thought, I'll just shoot and shoot and shoot. And I'll end up with like 20 exposures and maybe I can sort of layer them up in Photoshop. <laughs> um, so about for the Olympus cameras, about a thousand ISO, which is a bit higher than I like because they, they, they don't like the high ISO as a rule. Yeah. But shot the shots, got it back to the hotel, layered it up in Photoshop, came out looking mint. And everybody disappeared apart from this one woman who was in a bright pink vest, a sort of a puffy jacket, and she yeah. just had stood still. So I had to bring out the lasso tool and take her out. Take her out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing the effort people will go to to uh, to get rid of people in their shots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about that, do you prefer taking your photos on your own or with other people? Uh, I, I have to admit I'm a bit of a loner. I do like um, shooting by myself. I just I think one of the reasons for that is that I'm conscious that when I'm with other people. Uh, particularly if they're not photographers, they might be getting a bit impatient with me. I'll mm -hmm. just take one more shot, one more composition. The sky's really good. Can yeah. we wait five more minutes? You know, that sort of stuff. A, pa a patient um, partner is a very important uh, yeah. piece of photographic equipment as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we, we did that just the other day. We were coming back from Orange and I worked out there was a sunset coming up and could we just stop off at Katoomba on the way home, break the trip? And went to Boar's Head Lookout, and I've yep. never been there before, but I could see the sky was getting better and better. And I said, can we just hang on for like another 10 minutes, you know, because it's going to be a fantastic sky. And wife's going, oh, okay. And, and <laughs> luckily I brought a second camera so she could, you know, take some shots as well so that it kept yeah. everybody occupied. Um, but, yeah, basically I, I tend to shoot by myself. And often the reason for that is not uh, another reason is that, it'll be a spur of the moment sort of decision and I'll look at the sky and the tide and I'll think, well, tomorrow morning looks good. I'm just going to go sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes I meet up with people and that can be really fun because there's nothing better than talking to other photographers about gear and technique and all that sort of stuff. So Absolutely. I Absolutely. do enjoy that, but then I find I sort of miss shots because I'm too busy talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know what you mean there. You get, get distracted. So I, I guess talking about uh planning or not planning it sounds like a lot of what you do is spur of the moment stuff or do you do you do a lot of planning no I, I do do a fair bit of planning to be honest um when I say it's sort of spur of the moment it'll be to a spot that I've already scoped out or worked out right we'll work on a certain tide we'll work on a certain swell uh, I've looked at clear outside I've looked at windy over the week and worked out you know, noted down, well, Thursday morning looks like it could be good for sunrise because there's 100% high cloud or something. Yeah. And then it's a question of checking out what's the tide going to do, what's the swell going to do. Okay, so this morning, for instance, it was like a, a 1.3 rising tide at sunrise, S serious swell rolling in, you know, it was up mm, to two metres yeah. swell. So um, that immediately sort of in my mind I'm thinking, okay, that spot will work, won't be going to those spots. Um 
similarly, even if it's a really low tide, I know there's like three or four spots that I like to shoot on a low tide. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the similarly with the planning for the, the waterfalls, I'm, I'll be scanning the rainfall patterns in the Blue Mountains or wherever I'm going up the Central Coast. Uh, and seeing how much rain they've had over the last two, three days and whether it's too much or not enough. Um, if I'm doing a, a longer trip up, say, up to the Warren Bungles or down to the south coast, I keep a collection of images that people have taken of particular spots. So I'll have downloaded maps. So I've worked out all trails and how to get to So there actually is a lot of planning behind all of these locations because I figure yeah, right. you, you just don't have much time, particularly with the travel photography you're in a place for like a day or, a, or less and you've got this little window of time to take the shot. So you need to have everything going for you. Yeah, so I don't yeah. I don't sort of balk at working off other compositions that people have worked out because I'll probably go there, take something similar and then look for some more original compositions just because I'll probably only have a, an hour or two in the spot. Yeah, got it. So when you're in the field, are you, you know, sort of, going in with a concept of what it is that you're already uh, or you're going in with a concept of what it is that you want to shoot or are you sort of being a little bit more reactive to the conditions and the landscape? Yeah, it's a bit of both. I mean, it'll be um, I'll have an idea. If it's a location I haven't been to before, um, I will be standing on the shoulders of, of other giants on Instagram, you know, in terms of... Oh. Um, like, for instance, Katoomba Falls, I hadn't been there before. I'd sort of looked on the map and read on the web about the track in there. Um, when I got there, there was a composition I knew that I'd have to go over the fence to get, which is a bit yep. scary because there's like a 300-foot drop behind your back. Mm -hmm. um, and it was pouring with rain. And I got the shots that I wanted, but then I sort of turned around and saw this rather bizarre fallen tree that sort of looked like a minotaur or something, and I took some okay. photos of that. Um and and suddenly discovered other compositions, zoomed right in with a telephoto and, and took some other shots. So typically I'll go to a place and have an idea of what the hero shot looks like and try and get something like that and then scout around and try and look for new compositions or something a little bit different and original. Um, another example was up at Wentworth Falls and I walked down there and there's a, a shot a lot of people take where there's a sort of a secondary falls and then there's a big drop behind you and you have to get down low to sort of take that and you get the, the background falls in the background. And I yeah, got right. that. But it was absolutely pouring with rain and there was this really strong mist and wind coming. So as soon as you had your lens exposed, you were getting water on it. And so I put the tele... I, I found a sort of a, a calm spot and very gently changed my lens to a telephoto and then decided I could stand behind a rock, turn around and basically have it at a sort of a, a low ISO to get a bit of water flow, but mm. shoot, 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 and then quickly <laughs> hide back behind the rock. And um, I got this really nice shot of zoomed in on a feature of these sort of lower falls that I kind of really yeah, liked. Right. And, um, but that was just, you know, basically looking at what, what was being dealt on the day and deciding yeah. that I'd have to go with something handheld quick uh, and zoom in to sort of uh, get it. Otherwise, it was just going to be a mess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the number of, number of uh, waterfall and, and seascapes I've ruined by um, not bothering to wipe the lens before uh, before hitting the shutter. Is... I know, I know, and it's it's bad with a particularly what I find with a wide angle if you're shooting into any sun and any sort yeah. of objects on that that lens that parabolic lens will just pick up sun stars and things and. Yeah, very hard to to save those photos. <laughs> yeah, I I rarely ever bother, and <laughs> unless it, unless it's you know really, it, it's a really easy job. I I just I just give up on those. So speaking about processing, you straight into it when you get home, or are you sort of one that leaves it for a little bit before you you get into it and yeah, guilty is charged on the first one yeah. yeah typically i come back and um if i haven't got any meetings or work on you know it's a sunrise morning shoot um your memory card goes into the computer and i'm already in lightroom scanning through um starring ones that i think could be possible and then filtering that star and if there's nothing on in the morning i go right down the rabbit hole and end up processing photos but, you know, typically um, there'll be something on and I'll have to come back to it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I there is the sort of the thrill of going out there, taking the shots and thinking at the time, yeah, this could work really nicely. 
I wonder what it really looks like when I get it home and look at it on a big screen sort of thing. So there's that sort of thrill of discovery. Oh, yes, it did work. That's fantastic. Or no, look at all those sunspots and mist on the yeah, wings. Good, good, good <laughs> feeling when you nail it and uh, yeah. a very bad one when you don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So when, in terms of processing, are you all Lightroom, mix of Lightroom, Photoshop? Are you, you So know, I, I started... Yeah, I started probably this is a journey that many other people do. When I just sort of got into digital photography, I was watching YouTube and, and watching what famous people were doing and buying courses. And I started down the Lightroom path. And as I said, probably not a great way to go. I sort of bought some presets and just throwing them on and um, not thinking about a whole lot. And then as, as I've gone on, I guess, I've, I've purchased a number of online courses. I've watched a lot of YouTube videos. And I'm, a big discovery for me was the whole selective editing thing, uh, which yeah. you can do sort of in Lightroom now. But And yeah, the know, masking that's there now gives you the... the it does give you some of that. that. But yeah. I, I, I bought a course by uh, Nick Page. I bought another course with um, um, uh, Will Patino. Yep. Um, and then another one, Adam Williams at Easy Way Photography. That made Photoshop a little bit more easy for me to understand. So I have developed a workflow now where I, I'll be in Lightroom for an initial sort of raw tweak, um, uh, and then I'll go into Photoshop, and I typically do the heavy lifting in Photoshop. Particularly, I bracket a lot of my shots because of their seascapes. I'm shooting with an OM system camera, so the dynamic range is pretty good. It's not quite as glonies and things. Typically, three exposures. If it's a seascape with, with flow, the, the longer exposure will probably capture the flow, the short exposure for the sky. The, the middle one for the sort of the, everything else. That's the base yep. one. And I'll be using layers and blending in in layers, um, doing things with Gaussian blurs and doing things with sharpening and other stuff down the track. So, yeah, um, the full the full palaver in, in, in Photoshop and then back into Lightroom to finish it off, actually. So sort fair of enough. Full circle. Fair enough. Do you print much of your work or is it just on screen? Um. Yeah, this is another work in progress. I haven't printed a lot, truth be told. I've printed out a couple of things as gifts for people or sometimes I've sold a couple of prints. Um, and that whole transition of workflow into printing um, was something that I wasn't super confident about. You know, the um, the whole sort of way in which you've got to reprocess your photos so that it's print ready for your printers and, and all that sort of thing. So I watched a few YouTube videos and thought I had that, but then was a little disappointed with some of the outputs. So um, I have just purchased a course about how to do the printing thing. So mm. I am actually sort of learning this right now, um, trying to get my skills up around how to. Yeah, it's a bit, well, a bit instance, of a dark art, I find. It is. Yeah, yeah. a dark art. It's a good alchemy. <laughs> it's a very dark art. Um, so I have just been calibrating my screen. Yeah, that, and, that's the key um, is is screen yeah. calibration and yeah. knowing what you, you've got on the screen is going to be as close to what you print as possible. Yeah, I think that was my big worry. I was not confident that what I was seeing was what everybody else might be seeing. And yeah, yeah. once you have those doubts, uh, it sort of undermines the process. So, yeah, screen calibration. And now I'm working my way through different tutorials this chap's worked, uh, right. is doing. And he shoots with a similar camera system to me, which fills me with a bit more confidence because I think the camera system uh, that I'm shooting with is a little bit atypical, perhaps, from the full frame kit. So got to be a little bit more careful. Yeah, yeah. nice. How do you handle uh, when the creative? How do you handle it when your creativity dries up? Has yeah, it dried up? It hasn't really. I've been. I think it's part of just constantly learning new stuff. So, I see something on YouTube around um, uh, focus bracketing, for instance, and then think, "Oh, I've got. To, I've really got to nail focus bracketing or uh, exposure bracketing. Or is some sort of new technique to get an effect, to get mm. a look." And I'll see it on, uh, I'll see Nigel Danson or someone on YouTube doing this. And I think I should try and do that. I'll go out and do it. And that just adds to the sort of the creative juices in a way, because then you learn new tricks and you suddenly realize, well, that opens up a whole new window of what I could do potentially with this shot or this type of composition. So I haven't actually found there has been a creative problem. Um, the other part of it is, you know, my wanderings of an afternoon, I'll, I'll see a rock and I'll see some water and I think, that can make a really interesting photo and I'll get down there and try and shoot it. And maybe it didn't come out 
quite as well as I want, but I'll come back later and another day when the sky is really going off. And so this, I find there's both the technical learning new tricks technically in terms mm -hmm. of composition and shooting and then post-processing. And then there's the inspiration of just finding new things to photograph or new compositions. So yeah, right. I haven't really had a creative problem. Um, Lucky and the you. pandemic <laughs> actually helped. <laughs> I mean, I've I've tried to tried to avoid them, and you know, for me, uh, one of the things that I I try and do. I mean, th this podcast helps a lot because I'm always inspired by some of the people that I'm talking to. Mm. Uh, but is actually, you know, as you said, trying to challenge yourself with something new. You know, okay, well, I, I haven't done you know street photography for a while. Let's go and do some of that instead of doing a seascape. You know, and yeah, it, it's it's just about just trying to do something a bit different. I, I think to 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 keep fresh because otherwise, you know, you do you know if you keep going to the same places and taking the same style of shots, it's uh, you know it, it, it. I won't say it stunts your growth, but it doesn't necessarily promote growth in yeah in photography. yeah. And maybe maybe I am falling into that a little bit of around the seascape and the wide angle, and so I, I need to you know try new not new things, but you know, try other things, use telephotos a bit more and shoot close cropped shots of um, rocks with water or go out and do some street photography now. We're sort of out of the pandemic. So be yeah, yeah. yeah, well, you can now. It's uh, <laughs> a little bit easier anyway. What's your favourite thing about being a photographer? It's, um, it's a great creative outlet. So uh, as I said in my job, most of my job is writing, um, writing words, writing books, writing articles. Um, there's a lot of teaching too. Um, so having, having a creative outlet where you can get out and do something completely different, that's, that's a big part of the enjoyment of photography for me. Um, I, I do enjoy finding new uh, locations and seeing the world. So I, although I'm not doing a lot of travel, um, I'd, I wouldn't mind getting back into doing that. And photography allows you to sort of capture and share that. And, and I also find, I mean, I know there's a lot of criticism, people criticise photographers for living through their viewfinder and they're not experiencing that. But, but I actually find when I go back through the photos, I'm almost reliving the experiences that I had in these various places. So, yeah, I'm very much the same. I, 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 to be honest, I think it's the opposite. I I. I walk around the world trying to fit stuff into the viewfinder. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It can get a bit boring for people you're with because we'll be watching a television series and I'll be saying, oh, gee, look at that, you know, and, yeah. um, Mr. Robot or something, that wide-angle shot, and look at the colour grading. And they're saying, just watch the thing. <laughs> Absolutely. What's your least favourite thing about being a photographer? I don't know if I have a least favourite thing. Um I guess the the whole gear fetishism, I find that really annoying. Yeah. And and I haven't encountered it a lot, but occasionally you run into someone or you go to a workshop and they say, oh, you're not a serious photographer unless you're shooting with this camera or that camera. I just think that's just BS, you know. Um, you, you see these incredible shots that, that were taken 50, 60 years ago or, you know, um, or the whole street photography phenomenon um, where people were shooting with sort of small little handheld view you find a camera's thing. So uh, the, the technical... I've seen, bitch seen, seen a bloke that does absolutely stunning Polaroids, you yeah. know? Yeah. It, 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 it's not the gear. <laughs> no, no. And, in fact, I think the the, the obsession with the gear and the, the sharpness of this lens or that lens, all, all that sort of stuff can get in the way of, of being more creative. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that I guess that's one thing I don't like. But to be honest, that's, that's about it. I can't think of anything else I don't like about photography. I do love the ability to get out and travel and see the world and... Um, and photography sort of opens that up for you, um, I find. Yeah. Aside from climate change, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing photographers right now? Well, it's sort of a it's a challenge and it's, well, everybody's a photographer now, so everybody's got a phone and the, the sort of the devaluing of, of uh, photography as a potential art form, I find that a bit annoying. I think mm. that's a challenge. I don't know what to make of all the AI stuff that I'm starting to see on my Facebook feed and stuff. It's incredible images these computers churn out, but um, sort of manga type images. Uh, I do like them because I'm quite into sort of dystopian perspectives and things. Um, but for me, I think the ability to uh, for the human to craft something is is key. That's what distinguishes it. If you're just typing words into a computer, I guess there's human input in the words, 
but I, I'd like to yeah, see I mean, more. You could be quite control. creative in, in what you describe and what, yes. what, what you want, but ultimately it's not you deciding what goes into the image. No, um, no, exactly. And know, there was other, that criticism. Other than, other than those words. <laughs> yes. There was that criticism, I guess, in the history of photography early on from the art, from the artists, the painters saying, well, if you're doing realist painting, that's just being a photographer side of things. It's like a, a disparaging concept. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, photography is an art form, I think, when it's it's done creatively. So, yeah. yeah. What, what do you think the future of photography holds? It's really hard to know. Um, I guess... Uh, well, there's, I think there's always going to be demand for images of the world um, and whether they're painted images or photographic images, that demand will always be there. Uh, how we take those images or how we create those images is probably going to change a lot with technology. Mm. Um, and you can just see that in the last five, ten years, can't you, with the, the iPhones? Absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, all this sort of thing. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the human need for imagery uh, and understanding the world through imagery is always going to be there. It's almost innate. And you think of the old cave paintings that the, the, the Neanderthals and other were painting on the cave walls. And I was reading something recently about the discovery that it was the flickering of the flame that created the moving image of the cave paintings, which I, I yeah. think is fascinating. Yeah. So that's obviously always been there and probably always will be while, while we're around. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's uh, that, that's always going to be the biggest question, isn't it? How long are we going to be around? <laughs> while, while we are still around, are there uh, any particular photographers that are catching your eye that uh, you think I should be talking to? Um, there's there's a number that number of photographers overseas and in Australia that. That shoot with a similar camera system to the one I shoot, and so I'm I've sort of I biased towards them a bit, little bit. So there's a guy in the UK, Phil Norton, um, who, who shoots both Nikon and Olympus, um, mm -hmm. fantastic landscape photography. There's a chap in Canada, um, Peter Baumgarten, uh, yeah. he's in British Columbia, again amazing images. Um, uh, and then in Australia, there's a, there's a young guy, Matt Horsepool, who does a lot of underwater photography. Okay. Um, whales and, and fish and things, fantastic stuff. The last one, I guess, uh, a, a guy I met actually here at my local beach, but he's Belgian, I think, uh, but he's back in Europe now, Chris Iyer Walker, and he does a lot of uh, photography and video um, yeah. and, and really extreme stuff, so up the Faroe Islands and far-fung places, uh, and I, I, I've never been to that part of the world. I'd love to go there. I'd love to go to Iceland and places like that. Absolutely. Um, it's, a very, it's a very different aesthetic to, to what I'm used to, and maybe that's what attracts me to it. So those, mm. those guys produce some really interesting work. All right, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, I've got one more question, and uh, for many it's the most important. I think you know what's coming. Uh, <laughs> do you like pineapple on pizza? Yes, I do. Yes, I Plead guilty to that. Well, I don't know if I like it. I I, I will eat it. It's not my favourite. You will thing. eat it. All right. Yeah, I will you, definitely eat it. Do you order, it, it, do you order a Hawaiian or? I don't think I'd order a Hawaiian. No, I'd go for a margarita or, or some other pizza yeah, before yeah. then. But if it's on the table, it'll get eaten. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I'm I'm very much the same. If it's there, it'll get eaten. But uh, I I don't know that I'd go out of my way to buy it. <laughs> Indeed. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to have a chat today, Chris. It's been wonderful getting to know you a little bit better. Uh, how do people find your work? Uh, so I'm on Instagram, Chris Wright AU. Um, I'm on Vero now. I've discovered Vero in the last few weeks, really very much enjoying Vero. Mm. Uh, plug, plug for that one. Um, and uh, I have a, a web blog and, uh, and other pages. I can give you links to those. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. All right. I'll make sure that they're in the, the show notes. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.